the Turkana tribe is a nomadic pastoralist Nilota community indigenous to the Nile Valley, which inhibits the Turkana district in Kenya's Rift Valley province and constitutes the second largest pastoralist community in the country after the Maasai's and the third largest Nilotic ethnic group after the Kalenjin and the Luo. The community is also found in parts of Ethiopia, northeastern Uganda, and southern Sudan, and like the Maasai, they are well known for maintaining their traditional way of life and surviving in harsh and inhospitable terrain. Low rainfall, high temperatures, and poor soils means that the agriculture is near impossible, resulting in the Turkana being less affected by colonialism than other tribes because the colonialists saw little value in their land. As nomadic pastoralists, the Turkana kept livestock such as cattle, camels, goats, sheep, and donkeys, and constantly drove herds in search of water and pastures. The Turkana tribe originally came from the Karamojong region of northeastern Uganda, and according to some oral traditions, they arrived in Kenya while pursuing an unruly bull. Some researchers believe the migration into Uganda and Kenya was most likely caused by extreme drought or livestock overcrowding, which may have led to conflict between the various Karamojong groups. In traditional times, the Turkana people lived in relative peace with other neighboring tribes, but as resources and land became a point of contention between the various pastoralist communities, conflicts arose resulting in fighting that still impacts the region to this day. Customarily, neighboring groups often migrated together to the same regions in search of pasture and water, which required compliance and cooperation. When they'd arrive to a location where water was present, the elders from the various tribes would gather under a tree to determine when each tribe would have access to the water. They shared the limited natural resources in this manner, making sure to allocate and conserve carefully to avoid drought and shortages. Amongst the Turkana and their neighbors, many blame the arrival of Europeans for the conflicts between different clans in the region. Colonialists brought with them a system of revenue collection as a form of tax to the tribes, while also introducing borders and boundaries which divided the land and its people. Forcing tribes to pay them revenue, enforcing borders and boundaries, and introducing courthouses for trials effectively destroyed the culture and sovereignty of the Tokana community and their neighbors. By introducing courthouses, the colonialists undermined the traditional court system that had provided the community with justice and a peaceful place to deliberate and debate important issues for generations. Settlers also ignored any rights that the Dukana and other pastoralists had in regard to their land because they considered them valueless since they never settled in one region due to their nomadic lifestyles. Traditionally, the tree was viewed as the village court, where important discussions and decisions took place by the elders in the community. Those who were elected into leadership positions often exhibited several traits. They came from powerful clans, they were talkative and persuasive, or they were brave warriors known as morons, who could defend the community and had proven to efficiently manage their own households. Men who owned a lot of animals were also fast-tracked into leadership positions. Ultimately, the most important qualification of a prospective leader was determined by his character. Any man chosen to become a leader was required to care deeply for his people, be humble, perform good acts, and be willing to listen and share with others. One of the Tokana's people's most revered heroes was named Abei Wangamoe, a brave leader who protected the community by fighting different tribes and raiders. According to legend, Abei was born like other children, but God gave him a heart to defend his community. Thanks to his bravery in fighting off enemies, the Turkana people were able to settle permanently in their present location. During times of war, women were called upon to help fight enemies and protect the community. While the men were busy fighting in the field, the women would sneak into the villages and steal goods as a way to deplete the village of its resources. The Turkana god, known as Akuj in their language, was the reason they were able to have animals or enjoy the crops that resulted following a rainy season. The word Akuj itself derives from the same root as the words for up or above. Akuj was associated with the sky and could be addressed through prayer and rituals performed by rainmakers and prophets. Animal sacrifices were made to God in order to appease him at times of famine, drought, livestock epidemics, flooding, and other natural disasters beyond human control. The Turkana believe that since the sun rises from the east, God originates from that same direction. Therefore, all their prayers were directed to the eastern part of the sky.
Their main source of economic wealth were their animals, which provided food, clothing, shelter, and bargaining leverage during trades. The men had two main occupations. Either they were responsible for livestock or they were fishermen. The Takana also divided themselves up according to age groups, meaning that children born in a particular age set can call other men in a certain older age set father, even though there was no biological link. Age sets ensured that generations respected one another. Boys were also given leadership roles in terms of the different types of animals they were responsible for taking care of. Within the family structure, the firstborn was considered king and head of the family. Girls were assigned to fetch water and deliver it to elders, collect firewood, deliver messages and prepare for marriage by observing how their mothers took care of their home. They also were assigned animals to take care of once they were returned from the fields by their brothers. The Turkana tribe doesn't practice male or female circumcision, but instead they perform initiations for boys to mark their transition into manhood. When a boy reached the age of 10, a tooth was removed and he was taken to the trees. He would no longer be regarded as a child, but rather he was viewed as a warrior who could take care of himself, otherwise known as a moran. First, he bought a spear, which confirmed that he was now an adult. Secondly, he was paired up with a mentor who would help him throw out all his old possessions and give him new clothing, shoes, beads, and a stick. The mentor also gave the initiate four or five goats and only then was the young man allowed to sit in the company of elders. The elders would roast the slaughtered goats, and when the time came to eat the roasted meat, the young man would taste it and spit it out without swallowing. Traditionally, they also received unique haircuts, and before nightfall, the elders would smear the feces from inside the intestines all over the initiates before blessing them with sticks. When guns were introduced to the region during World War II, an arms race between the Turkana and other Karamajong communities like the Pokot was initiated thanks in part to the British recruitment of fighters from communities who embraced an ethno-military culture. Britain deployed a large number of Turkana soldiers onto the front lines during their war with Italy and Ethiopia after recognizing the community's existing dexterity with firearms and knowledge of the harsh physical terrain. Following the war, the Tokana returned with guns in order to keep their homesteads safe. Women were taught how to use the weapons in case the homesteads were attacked or raided while the man of the house was in the field fighting. The conflict between the Tokana and Pokot communities has displaced thousands of people, prevented agro-pastoral communities from accessing large areas of pasture and water, and hindered the mobility of migratory herders. Traditionally, the Turkana relied on the elder from the tribe's most powerful clan to consult and advise them on how to survive attacks from their enemies or to avoid a drought. They would bring the elder gifts such as animals, which they would slaughter in his honor. Following the animal sacrifice, the elder would send the villagers away for a few days in order to gather his thoughts. He would then call them back and offer advice on how to move forward to resolve the issue. Following the election of a leader, the elders would gather with him under a tree and issue blessings which are called Agata in the Turkana language. All the elders would carry sticks and face east towards where the sun rises every morning. To prevent an enemy from attacking, the Turkana killed a reddish or black goat. These goats were killed by pulling out their eyes and breaking their legs. This was done by the community to prevent the enemy from walking. There were sticks that were used to beat the goat and the animal would be beaten until it died. By pulling out the goat's eyes, they believed that they had ensured that the enemy will not see. The legs of the goat were broken so that the enemy could not use his hands or his feet to harm the community. If the legs were broken, the enemy could not do anything. A daughter was considered to be the equivalent of gold for Tokana families because of the size of dowry she could command once she got married. A beautiful, faithful, and smart daughter could change the fortunes of a family overnight. Traditionally, a Tokana family married off their daughter in one of two scenarios. When a man in the village identified their daughter as nice and beautiful, he would approach the elders and men of the community who would then arrange a meeting with the girl's family. Negotiations for her dowry would take several weeks, resulting in a bridal payment that might include 30 to 50 cattle, 30 to 50 camels, and 100 to 200 small stock animals. 
The second scenario in which a couple got married involves stealing the bride, which was often a symbolic ceremony agreed to by both families when a man was unable to pay the full dowry. A man would identify the woman he wanted to marry, then kidnap her when she was alone collecting water or herding the animals. The second scenario in which a couple got married involves stealing the bride, which is often a symbolic ceremony agreed to by both families when a man was unable to pay the full dowry. A man would identify the woman he wanted to marry, then kidnap her when she was alone collecting water or herding the animals. The man would take her to his father's homestead, where he would hold her hostage and await the arrival of her father and male relatives. Once her family received the news, they would arrive to the kidnapper's home, brandishing whips, and fight him and his male family members in a symbolic ritual not meant to result in any injuries or deaths. The two parties would then sit under a tree to discuss the fines that would be levied against the kidnapper for his crime. Eventually, they'd settle on a dowry price that the man's family could afford to pay. Men were allowed to marry as many wives as they could afford to support. The other wife or wives had no option but to agree with this decision. Those who refused were often beaten until they agreed. Once a woman was married, she lost her right to dictate how and when her body could be used. The husband viewed her as a property since he paid an expensive dowry to acquire her. Since she was part of a legal transaction, the man felt it was his right to determine when and how they would have sex. At times, men would forcibly perform sexual acts despite her objections, even when she was on her period. A typical homestead known as an awi was made up of a man, his wives, the children, and often his mother and other dependent female relatives. Each wife would build a daytime sitting hut called an ekal and a nighttime sitting hut called an aki that was used during the rainy season. When the husband married another wife, she would stay with the first wife until she got her first child. During traditional times, the birth of a male or female child was marked by what instrument was used to cut the umbilical cord. If the newborn was a baby girl, a knife would be used, while a spear would be used to cut the umbilical cord if the baby was a boy. A spear was used for the boy as a symbol that he would one day be the head of his family in charge of looking after the animals and defending the tribe. The umbilical cord would remain attached to the mother until it fell off naturally. The birth of a baby girl would be marked with a small blessing ceremony called adaya that was held outside the family's homestead. A goat was slaughtered and bad omens, such as those that prevented women from bearing children, would be rendered powerless during the ceremony. The entire goat was eaten on the same day as it was slaughtered, with the women eating their portion during the day and the men finishing it off during the evening. The mother remained in the house for up to four days, by which time the other half of the umbilical cord had fallen off. The women in the village would clean up the area where the mother delivered the baby. A woman's power was directly related to the position her husband held in the community. For example, the wife of a chief was afforded more power than the wife of a farmer. For the most part, however, women were not allowed to hold any leadership positions in the community, and even standing in front of people to speak was unheard of. Since they had no education and didn't know their rights, women were relegated to being followers of their husbands and fathers instead of leaders. The fundamental reason the Turkana saw little value in women was because wives were essentially valued the same as a group of animals thanks to the dowry system. For the most part, women were responsible for maintaining the welfare of the family, which included taking care of the children and cleaning, fetching water and firewood, collecting and cooking food, delivering messages and packages, and building homes and animal sheds. Women were often overworked and underappreciated due to the high price of their dowry, but many were proud because it meant that their family was able to eat and multiply their wealth thanks to the value their daughter was producing as a wife. Women were also rainmakers who prayed and performed rituals during times of drought, in addition to traditional healers who were able to cure people using combinations of herbs. The Turkana diet consisted of sorghum, wild fruit, milk, meat, and blood from animals. Those who lived near bodies of water mainly ate fish. Meat was prepared in two ways. Goat was roasted without being skinned, and the Turkana would eat it as is. There was also goat that was prepared after being skinned. Dried camel meat called nyiri nyiri was considered a delicacy and was prepared by wives who cut it into small pieces and packed it inside a stick for a month. 
It was eaten slowly by the man of the house and his children. When a husband died, his wives were usually inherited by a brother or the son of a co-wife, but they had the right to refuse to be inherited and could live with one of their sons. The eldest son would inherit his father's youngest wife to ensure that she wasn't taken by a man from another family. The husband's ornaments would be taken by members of his age set. A powerful elder wore animal skin decorated with beads. Morons killed a baboon and used its skin as shoulder pads for leaders in order to differentiate them from the other men in the tribe. Women also wore animal skins on their body, but the size and color differed depending on their marriage status. The skin that was worn by girls was different from the skin that was worn by mothers. Girls also wore an ornament on the head, while mothers wore necklaces and metal ornaments. Women were not allowed to dress in white or red clothes, but instead were required to only wear black and green colors. A woman's perceived beauty was in direct relation to the number of necklaces she wore. Women who wore many necklaces were considered beautiful and were quickly chosen as wives, while those whose family couldn't afford to sell a cow to purchase necklaces found it difficult to land a husband. The number of necklaces that a girl wore also determined her dowry price. The necklaces advertised whether a girl was ready to get married or not. Girls also applied red soil on their skin to appear more beautiful to potential suitors. Other than the necklaces, the women wore nothing to cover up their chests. In general, they wore very little clothing and applied red soil on their private parts. The buttocks were not covered, but medals and armlets were worn on the arms and legs. Traditionally, a man who died would not be buried. Instead, he would be placed in a goat shamba and covered with fresh branches. When a woman died, however, her body was put inside a house. Blacksmiths in the village were known as gununoi, and they made spears by heating metal in fire using a round stone called mtotoi. The blacksmiths heated the metal until it turned red and then shaped it into a spear. After shaping it, they inserted another piece of metal inside the heated metal and folded it in half before attaching it to a stick carved from a special tree called Akalia Bome. The side with the spear was used during combat and the other end was used to measure the depth of water in a river or to dig boreholes for their animals. Women used wood from a special tree to make gourds which they decorated using ostrich shells and beads. Special clay and mud was used to decorate the skin of warriors as a way to artistically showcase their bravery and every Turkana ceremony involved ostrich feathers which attached to clay ornaments that were placed on people's heads to add color and style to their outfits. As pastoralists, the Turkana people migrated to different locations, often in search of water and pasture, often settling in flat areas populated by acacia trees. Acacia trees were vital when determining where to settle because the Tukana used them to build sheds to protect their livestock from wild animals. Flat land was preferred because living under a mountain or valley would make them easy targets for raiders. Their temporary homes were simple and didn't take the women in the village long to build because they were likely to move from that location in search of greener pastures. Some members of the Turkana community practiced witchcraft, relying on sorcerers and prophecies to make sense of what couldn't be explained in the world. For example, a witch doctor would take some snuff and put it on top of a shoe which would allow him to foretell rain or drought. In other instances, they would spread animal intestines on a flat surface in order to figure out which direction an enemy was going to attack the village from. Many leaders came to sorcerers for advice and to benefit from the use of black magic. When the leaders wanted a promotion or a senior position in the government structure at the time, they would visit sorcerers to fast track their desires. Sleeping with another man's wife was considered adultery and was looked down upon by the Tukana people, as was sleeping with another woman's husband. Sex before marriage was also looked down upon. When a woman had sex with a Moran or a warrior, a song of condemnation was sung by the other women. Adultery, which is known as Elomi in the Tukana language, was and still is strictly forbidden. Anyone who committed adultery was sentenced to death or subjected to humiliating punishment in front of the entire village. Some adulterers were forced to hang themselves and their corpses would be left dangling from the tree. Anyone who removed the person off the tree would be seen as having committed the same crime and would also be hanged. Incest or marriages between blood siblings was not allowed. Killings was only allowed during times of war or in self-defense. And there were parts of the goat or sheep that was not supposed to be eaten. 
For instance, the back of the goat and its tongue were not seen as fit for human consumption, and women were not allowed to eat the intestines.